I found myself very often with patients sitting in front of me, having them say things like, I feel like I'm in survival mode. I feel like I'm at the end of my rope. I feel like I'm just living on fumes. And when I started to hear that survival mode, it actually took me back to remembering when I read Robert Sapolsky's book, Why Mm. Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. ulcers. This book is a phenomenal explanation of the stress response system and how it affects us systemically. And I was talking with someone about this and she said, oh, so like, oh, I was saying they're like in survival overdrive. And she said, oh, like survival overdrive, it's like a syndrome. She said that and my brain went, oh, SOS. And then I was like, oh, that's oh, perfect. That's for perfect. Exactly what we're yes. talking about. Like, Cause you feel like you need an SOS. Hello, and welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm Dr. Julie Fouché, family physician and former CrossFit Games athlete. Here, I bring you information and inspiration to help bridge the gap between fitness and medicine and support your journey toward your healthiest self. Thank you so much for joining me. Now let's get started with this week's episode. All right. Well, welcome to Pursuing Health. I am very, very excited about today's episode. I am interviewing a woman who I have looked up to and followed for a very long time in medicine, and I'm very excited to be speaking today with Dr. Aviva Ram. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted. (laughs) <laughs> I want to share before we dive in, because we have a lot to talk about. I want to just um, share a little bit about your bio because it's very impressive. And I think, you know, so many of the reasons why I've been interested in following your path. Um, so you are a MD, you are also a midwife herbalist, um, did your MD medical training at Yale, board certified in family medicine with obstetrics. So go family medicine. Mm -hmm. Um, You're a a practitioner, teacher, activist, and advocate of both environmental health and women's reproductive rights and health. I've been bridging the best of traditional medicine, total health, ecology, and good science for over three decades, a longtime home birth pioneer and birth activist, and your company's philanthropic arm, Dharma Moms. Yeah. provides funding for organizations working towards reproductive justice and birth equity in high-risk obstetric communities, which is so amazing and important. Also a world-renowned herbalist, author of the textbook Botanical Medic- Medicines for Women's Health, as well as seven other books, including Hormone Intelligence, an instant New York Times bestseller that explores the impact of the world we live in on women's hormones and health and brings us new medicine for women that is at once holistic and natural, while being grounded in the best science and medicine it has to offer. You also have a podcast, articles, books, and online programs that help women take back their health. And your innovative professional programs are educating the next generation of healthcare practitioners. And you live and practice in the Berkshires and New York City. So um, I'm excited. I, we were just talking before we pressed record that I'm taking your functional and integrative medicine um, practitioner course, which starts next week. And I'm very excited about that. I'm so and, to have you. <laughs> and I, I have just been so fascinated by, you know, your unique background and the way that you so seamlessly blend Eastern and Western medicine and this holistic perspective of taking care of women. And so I'm excited to, to dive in on that, but you know, I've been thinking about this interview for a long time. And then last week you shared a podcast and blog on perfectionism and it's titled perfectionism, healing the shadow side. And I felt like, you know, this is perfect timing because I feel like reading and listening, you were describing so much of my experience over the last two years. And I feel like we probably have a lot in common and a lot to talk about there. So I'd love to like all the dive into that. Women are going to be like, yes, that's me. That's me. That's me. Because that is the shadow side, right? It's that like is right. Everything that brings us to excellence, which I mean, you're a competitive athlete, you're a healthcare provider. You have all the things that drive you to do what you do really, really well. And we want our healthcare providers and our athletes to be excellent. But the right. shadow side is like the relentless part that no matter how much we achieve, it's like, I could be better. I don't know enough. And it's the part that we just live with in our heads and we don't talk about and we don't share about. And, um, and instead we have this, you know, we want to have this image of, of perfection. And I think, and we live with it in our heads, but I mean, we live with it in our bodies too, right? Yes. It affects us. So true. So true. Well, 
And, and I love how you talk about it too. You know, we acknowledge the good parts of it, right? The parts of it that have allowed us to be successful in life. And then there's also this shadow side, like there is of probably most any quality. So I guess, how did you, how did you come to discover and identify, like what went into the writing of this blog? Why now? And, and why do you think it's important? Yeah. So it's actually something that I had written quite a long time ago. And then I went back into it and revived it and was like, okay, this is really happening for me again in the moment. Mm, So the backstory of how that particular article came about and podcast came about was a patient of mine who it was eight or 10 years ago came to see me. She is also just like this incredibly high functioning, very driven, um, in her sixties at the time I saw her last, I saw her initially. She was working out two hours a day, six days a week with a personal trainer, running a company, has Mm -hmm. four grown kids, grandkids traveling all around the country. And and also like her kids are all literally doctors and lawyers. (laughs) Her husband's really successful. So she had like all of this high, high functioning, great stuff going on in her life. Mm -hmm. But she had this intense inner unrest. Mm -hmm. She was just kind of dogged all the time by this inability to just kind of relax and put it all down. Mm -hmm. And like, she was never quite fit enough, never quite successful enough, all the things like not quite enough and just pushing herself. So by the time she came to me, she had Hashimoto's. She was really more tired and wired than exhausted. Like she was functioning and keeping on going all day long. So she wasn't particularly exhausted in the day, but when it came to going to bed at night, she just couldn't, it was like her brain couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. It was like, Mm -hmm. close her eyes and it was like the light bulbs were still on, you know? And so with all of my patients, I always try to look at, you know, where did this person come from? Where did this, like conventional medicine just sort of is like, okay, you're diabetic. That started today. Let's give you medication. It's not like, right. where did this come from? You have, you know, whatever it is, rheumatoid arthritis. Oh, you, it's genetic. Let's not bother to look at all the things. Mm-hmm. So I always like to look at all the things. And I also like to know who my patients are. Like, who's this human being in front of me? So I went back in her story with her. And what I learned about Marnie is that she grew up in a tenement setting in a major city to immigrant parents from Eastern Europe who had come over due to political unrest that they escaped from. And they were quite poor. There were five kids living in this tenement, you know, like, I mean, like, you know, not adequate heat, all mm, the things. Mm-hmm. A lot of And stuff. yeah. And so she, um, from the earliest she could remember, she got a meager allowance that her dad could afford, you know, like a quarter kind of thing. She worked, she saved. As soon as she could get a job, she got a job. As soon as she could get a second job, she got a second job. And by the time she was in college, she had two jobs. She was going to school at night and on weekends. And I'm sitting with this woman and it was as if some kind of, I don't even know how to explain it. Even now, like when I say it, I get goosebumps, but mm. it was just like this moment of clarity. And I looked at her and just out of my mouth tumbled, Marnie, you're feeding hungry ghosts that aren't even chasing you anymore. And I had mm. only ever heard that expression, hungry ghosts. In, it was a Tracy Chapman song that in <laughs> the material world, she says a line about hungry ghosts. And, mm-hmm. um, it turns out that it's actually a concept in Buddhism where you have, and they have like these demons that look that, you know, like they're depicted Mm -hmm. visually, you can look online and they're like these skinny demons, but this full belly. And they're these demons of emotional or some kind of empty space that you're always trying to fill, but can never be satisfied. Mm -hmm it's trauma that we're always trying to heal from or some some emptiness that we're trying to replace that void. Mm-hmm. And for her, the fear was that if she stopped at any time in her life, she was going to be back in poverty. That was mm-hmm. it. Like she was going to go from riches to rags mm-hmm. like overnight and be back in that tenement. So when I reflected that to her, she, you could just see like she just stopped. You know, like when you're with a patient and you're just like, Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. And she was like, she took a second 
or like half a minute, she was like, wow, that is exactly what's happening. So at that point, I was sometimes still doing my, you know, it still happens. I do my medical notes, mm -hmm. you know, hours or the next day after, like, what mm -hmm. is it with medical notes that you just want to put them <laughs> off? And then right. It's become like that. Just always fall to the bottom of the oh list. Oh my gosh. They're like the only part of patient care I don't like. And I do oh, very like personalized notes. So we had had dinner and it was like eight o'clock and I'm sitting and typing up her note. And I was just like, wow, Aviva. She is like, you know, like in the um, Christmas Carol movies, like there's the ghost of Christmas past. Mm -hmm. It's like, she is your ghost of Christmas future. Wow. Um, she is like your cautionary tale. I mean, she's absolutely lovely. I mean, love her. And mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't like, oh, you don't want to be like that when you grow up because I would totally. She's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. She's amazing. <laughs> and at the same time, I was like, you are living with the same relentless fears that are driving you mm. to do more and more and more. And, you know, we all have like, when we're building a career, there is that point in your career where you do say yes to a lot of things mm -hmm. because you're paying your dues, you're building your platform, you're getting out there in the world. So, and I was Absolutely. teaching a lot and doing a lot of things. And all of those things were things I love doing, but there was this underbelly of it, of like, and a, like a, almost like a low hum of anxiety that was also accompanying, well, don't say no, because if you say no to this, then you might not get the other opportunity. And then you might not like mm -hmm. build this and then you might not have adequate economics and then everything might fall apart. So I was operating under that same I'm kind of fear. Line, like, yeah, really. Mm -hmm. And so that was going on for me. And then very shortly after I came up against a wall, I was working in a very high profile um, medical setting and it was not a healthy situation for me anymore. And I needed mm -hmm. to branch out on my own. And it was a long six month process in coming. And finally it reached just this critical mass of like, mm -hmm. no, I can't come back. Mm -hmm. And the person I was working for went ballistic on me, so ballistic that I literally had to put the phone on speakerphone so my husband could hear because I didn't think anyone would believe that the things yeah. that were being yeah. said to me were actually was so abusive. Wow. And when I left that job that day, it was like this experience. Have you ever been in an electrical storm and all the electricity in your house goes out and it's so quiet? Mm -hmm. Like you didn't realize the refrigerator was humming. Absolutely. Like all the sound is gone. <laughs> and it was this kind of that experience with Marnie and then following very quickly after that, this complete inner quiet where I could actually feel that I had this, I'm very like kind of body aware. Mm -hmm. And I actually felt this sensation as if I had an, a motor or an electric generator mm. running in my solar plexus mm -hmm. that suddenly was quiet. And I was like, okay, you're okay. Mm -hmm. You're going to be okay. You're fine. You don't have to live out that old story mm -hmm. of fear and scarcity anymore. And what I would say is that it's a process. It happened. It, it comes back periodically where like I get into not on purpose, but we're like, it just kind of kicks in that old mode kicks in and it's still part of me, mm -hmm. but I have that touchstone of quiet. Mm -hmm. So when now I'm in that other space of like doing too much saying yes, that motor feels like it's running again, mm -hmm. like I'm on this automatic pilot of driven instead of driving myself, mm -hmm. I can remember the touchstone more quickly and say, okay, I don't like feeling like this. I want to feel like that. And granted, I mean, I've arrived at a place in my work and my career where I have more latitude to say mm -hmm. no to things. And But the fear doesn't go away. I don't come from like a trust fund where I can just sort of like retire tomorrow. <laughs> like I still have to do the things. So the fears right. come up. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's kind of the story of how it all happened. And I think for so many women, it shows up in so many different ways. And some of us have, well, and to add to that, for me, as I sat with my own story, 
just in a nutshell, I grew up in a housing project, single mm -hmm. mom. I was born in 66. So this was in the seventies. It wasn't like a knife and gun clubs housing project at that time. Mm -hmm. By the time I was hitting like 12 years old, crack cocaine had come in. It wasn't an easy place to be either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have a deep love of words and a deep love of science. And from a very early age, like first grade, I won my first science fair. My second grade, I was winning my first spelling, bee, you know, like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I love those things. And I was rewarded for those things mm -hmm. and they became a, di a diversion. And also they became a source of like maybe dopamine support mm -hmm. or success or validation, yeah. but they also became my way out of that housing project so that by 14, I had won enough spelling bees and enough science fairs and done the things and gotten into the prestigious New York public, but like very famous high school mm -hmm. to the point that by the time I was 14 and a half, I was accepted to college. Wow. So this combination of like excellence mm -hmm. and intellect paired with reward and safety became this two sides mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of the coin for me. And so much of that, you know, early conditioning when you're a child is stuff that you know, we all develop these patterns that are so subconscious that then influence our behaviors later in life and our thought Absolutely. patterns and our emotions. And so, um, yeah, I what them as default modes mm -hmm. and some of us have perfectionism as a default mode. Some of us go into, let's say I call it good girl mode. Mm -hmm. And that can arise from, and many perfectionists are also, you know, we have multiple aspects of these things, but sometimes the good girl might've been a situation where, for example, um, there was a lot of mental health or emotional turbulence in the childhood home. And the thing to do was to not create waves, you know, to just be good, keep everything mm -hmm. smooth or mm -hmm. the person who goes into the helping mode. And the good girl is a wonderful thing. You know, you are a person who is often quite, um, you're Switzerland, you know, you're mm -hmm. the mediator, mm -hmm. but it's easy to also become more of a little bit of a doormat or be abused or say yes to things or take crap that you shouldn't have to take. And not or, stand up for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Or the person who becomes the healer and the helper and, and may sometimes become more of a martyr and may even become resentful sometimes because they feel like that. So I don't want to be facile or like label people, mm -hmm. but it's more tendencies that I have come to notice in myself and talk mm -hmm. more with my patients about too. Mm -hmm. And I think there are tendencies that often are coupled with like, sometimes I'll have a patient who will come in with a certain constellation of not just physical symptoms, but emotional or psychological things going on. And I'll just say, do you just, just, out of curiosity, do you happen to have an alcoholic parent or a bipolar parent? And they'll just look at me like, how did you know? <laughs> yeah. like, just, you know, I've just kind of seen some of these patterns before. And often people are like, they feel seen and recognized also, mm -hmm. and it allows them to put it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so much of it is recognizing, understanding how those patterns developed and then recognizing them in yourself so that you can accept yourself for them. Because I think yes. so many times we you know, we're beating ourselves up because, well, why am I this way? And then when you can understand and see that, oh, well, this is how the, you know, the child in me was able to find safety or acceptance or cope with whatever was going on around me. It's such a natural thing. I mean, it's a, it's a human evolutionary trait to need to fit in and stay safe. Mm -hmm. And I think too, like for me, I have to start to look at um, when that pattern is triggered Mm -hmm. what's going on in my life? Am I not sleeping enough? Did Is something really particularly stressful going on? Was there some reminiscent trigger that set mm -hmm. that off? And how do I reduce the things in my life that cause me to be or stay in that pattern? Well, on that note, I'd love to hear a little bit about your path. Your path. So, you know, you get accepted to college when you're 14 and a half, yeah. but how did you then go down the path of becoming an herbalist and then a midwife? Yeah, it's kind of a funny story. So I went off to college. I got accepted when I was 14, started 
I'm born in June. I started September of the year I was 15. And within like two months, I had this kind of hippie roommate from Vermont. (laughs) And I got connected with this man who is this beautiful Mayan descent, Latino man whose mother was a hunter college professor in Latino women's studies. And just sort of was out of the housing project in this very liberal, crunchy, and extremely unregulated environment. Mm -hmm. So quite honestly, within like two months, (laughs) I went vegetarian, was listening to reggae, started smoking (laughs) weed, started taking mushrooms, and got really interested in food politics, women's Mm. health policy. And it's so funny because like in the past, I would have said those things. Mm -hmm. People even now they're like, oh my God, she did that when she was 15. But keep in mind, I was in college. So it was like a little bit of a fast forward for me. (laughs) Right. Um, But now when I talk about mushrooms and cannabis, people are like, oh, wow. (laughs) And I don't actually do those things now, but they were really um, mind altering, eye opening Mm -hmm. portals into a completely different way of thinking and being. Mm -hmm. And that was accompanied by, at the same time, Cold War, nuclear arms escalation. Mm -hmm. And that drove a lot of, I think, more than I realized at the time, a a desire or, or sense of need to learn how to be more in control of things like my healthcare, should I ever need to be, or should my community need me to be? So Mm -hmm. I really wanted to learn how to receive babies into the world and know basic barefoot medicine and learn herbs. And so that was happening. And at the same time, I was learning about the intersection of the, the industrial chemical pharmaceutical complexes and the food industry and how they were all tied together. And I really was such an idealistic, I haven't really changed that much, radical, (laughs) haven't changed that much, teenager. Mm -hmm. And the ways forward that I found were to study midwifery and to learn herbal medicine. But there was nothing at that time. I mean, even the first naturopathic school was still a glimmer. Wow. The term integrative medicine didn't exist yet. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, it was the, it was like very early here. Yeah. Nothing. Mm-hmm. So I left school at 16 and apprenticed <laughs> myself to a midwife, started studying everything I could on herbal medicine, which at the time was like four books existed <laughs> literally wow. so going into old you know, old texts that I could find. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of how it all happened. It started. And wow. so I was learning all kinds of things. Like, I don't know that I could still do this, but I know how to do fire by friction, skin animals, brain hand hides, make cordage, wow. create shelter in the woods. Like I was really in it. And mm-hmm. um, yeah. That was what so I was cool. And, and so that fun. led to midwifery practice, herbal medicine practice. And it was such an early time. I remember at one point, I don't know, maybe about 10 years ago, Googling something when, when we had, this was before Google that I was mm-hmm. doing all this, but I Googled something on um, herbs and pregnancy. And like the first three things that came up were things I wrote. And I was like, this is actually a very scary state of affairs. <laughs> but, and there's more now on it, but yeah. Um, I think I was just a few steps ahead. So that really opened the door for me to teach and write and Mm -hmm. be kind of almost like people now say like, oh, pioneer. Mm -hmm. And then I had my children. And at some point, the concept of integrative medicine started to grow. There was herbal medicine. There were, you know, naturopaths. There's all the things that we have Mm -hmm. now. But there was this huge, and still is, a pretty big, chasm between Mm -hmm. what was happening outside of the halls of conventional medicine and what was happening inside of it. And it was at that time that people were getting more interested in doing things out of the box, but conventional medicine was very rigid. So for example, a woman could, a mama could take her four-year-old to the pediatrician and the the baby, the four-year-old could have an earache. Mm-hmm. And the pediatrician would immediately recommend antibiotics because that was recommended for everything, still kind of is, even <laughs> though we know 70% of antibiotics recommended are inappropriately prescribed. Yeah. 
And the mom might say something back like, um, well, is it a viral infection? Like, do we need antibiotics? And the pediatrician would often say something like, do you want your child to go deaf? Do you want your child to die? Wow. Or a woman could be having a home birth and try to transfer to the hospital and really be mistreated. In fact, when I was apprenticing as a midwife, there was a woman who was in that situation. She wasn't even having, she wasn't even labor yet, but she was planning a home birth. Mm -hmm. She had severe, and she was, a, she was an African-American woman too. She had severe abdominal pain, went to the local hospital, didn't have insurance and was sent away and ended up with something called a placental abruption and lost the baby. She survived. Wow. That case actually changed some of the laws around emergency departments having to accept. But, so this was the state of things wow. at that time. Mm -hmm. And when uh, was this? What about That was year? Atlanta that that happened. Okay. Um, that was Atlanta around 1983. No, around 1986 or seven. Okay. And so these cum accumulated stories and just stories of women not being seen or not being heard or me doing a pelvic exam to do a pap on one of my postpartum clients and the woman just crying because she's never had like a gentle pap before. All the stories. Mm -hmm. Finally, just I said to myself, I need to go back to the path and pick it up because my original plan when I went to, to college young was to be a physician. Mm -hmm. So that was when I restarted on that path or picked it where I left off and went to med school to really be that bridge, if you will, between the worlds. So, mm -hmm. that, so that in conventional medicine, I can be a voice that says, hey, we need to be open to some of these things. Even if we don't believe in them, our clients or our patients are going to mm -hmm. use them. So we still need to know about them. But then also be that person that when someone was struggling with something and they needed to go into the system, mm -hmm. they had a voice they could trust. Mm -hmm. so that's Which is an incredible, you know, task in itself to go back to medical school when you already had all your children. Right. And so, and you, you know, you have a career, you're working. Oh, what was that experience saying, like? Cause medical oh, school was hard enough for me as, you know, just being myself and being in my twenties. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, it was something else to do it that way. It was interesting because when I was getting ready to go, I knew quite a few physicians who were mothers who were just incredibly encouraging and supportive mm -hmm. and they knew, they knew what it was going to be like and yeah. they were like, do it. And I don't regret in any way. I mean, it was some of the best educational years of my life and being around mm -hmm. some of the most stellar people and just these constant aha eureka moments of like, oh, that's <laughs> what happens physiologically that's what that means, you know, translating mm -hmm. something that an herb does to like actually seeing it mm -hmm. in, in a pelvis or an abdomen in like real life in a surgery. Like, oh, that's what astringent, you know, or wow. body uterus means. <laughs> it's really exciting, but definitely like sometimes moms will ask me about going to medical school with little ones. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yes, definitely. Also know that <laughs> if you're on call, you can't just call in and say, I'm not coming because my child has a fever or because it's their birthday or... Mm -hmm all the things. And it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot. So yes. And my husband was so funny because we've been together forever. And when I was getting ready, when I was planning to go and like doing my applications, he's like, we've got this, babe, we've got this. And I'm like, <laughs> we've totally got this. No idea. Dude, what you're getting yourself like, into. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. I know. I'm like, you know, mansplaining <laughs> the whole thing. Like how yeah, we've got this. And I can just remember coming home some days of just him like, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> with him with four kids oh my yeah. goodness wow uh well that's incredible I know you know a lot of people are glad that you went and and to be oh, able to bring the perspectives you. I can't say my kids do. all were at the time but <laughs> I'm sure it was hard for them too and a big sacrifice for them that's great um back to so back to perfectionism or as yeah. you as you call it perfectionism with a capital p we we know and as as you explained in your patient Marnie and, and you said this can have a lot of implications on our bodies too. And you've actually coined something called survival overdrive syndrome. Can you <laughs> explain how that all works? And then what are some of the physical symptoms that we can start to experience from? Yeah, I'm from such this? a like sort of serious doctor that I'm not <laughs> one who's like, oh, call it the Aviva method or call like, I'm just, you know, <laughs> that's like when you're you, you've gotten your Nobel prize and you've died, then you can call <laughs> something after you. And I was trying to figure out like, how do I translate 
what it is that I'm talking about. And I found myself very often with patients sitting in front of me, having them say things like, I feel like I'm in survival mode. I feel like I'm at the end of my rope. I feel like I'm just living on fumes. And when I started to hear that survival mode, it actually took me back to remembering when I read Robert Sapolsky's book, Why mm. Zebras Don't, Get, don't ulcers. get Ulcers. Yeah. I love that book. Even now, it's such a phenomenal book. And so he's a primatologist and a neurologist at Stanford. And this book is a phenomenal explanation of the stress response system and how it affects us systemically and how it really, it doesn't happen in the animal kingdom until you get to us at the top of the food chain, basically. Because <laughs> of our big brains. He doesn't yeah. Offer, yeah. He doesn't really offer solutions per se, but he really lays out the physiology and pathophysiology of, uh, you know, hyper, hyper vigilance in the amygdala leading to, or, you know, memories in the hippocampus leading to activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And so, something just kind of clicked in my brain. I'm like, I need to go back to that book. And as I did, I was like, this is checking off all the boxes of the things mm. that my patients are telling me. They're laying mm -hmm. down at night and they can't fall asleep and they're tired, tired and wired, or they're having digestive symptoms or their immune systems are disrupted. And they're all these kind of like either subtle chronic symptoms or sometimes actually bigger symptoms mm -hmm. like hypertension or arrhythmias or cognitive dysfunction or autoimmune conditions or mm -hmm. all the things. And I was like, wow, this is really checking off all the boxes. And I was talking with someone about this and she said, oh, so like, oh, I was saying they're like in survival overdrive. And she said, oh, like survival overdrive. It's like a syndrome. In my mind, I love, <laughs> as I said, I was the spelling bee kids. I love yes. playing with words. I remember I would hear acronyms in medical school, like the Comet trial. And I was like, <laughs> I just want a job where I name those acronyms. They're so, <laughs> so like, cool. So she said that and my brain went, oh, SOS. And then I was like, oh, that's oh, perfect. That's for perfect. Exactly what we're yes. talking about. Like, because you feel like you need an SOS. Mm -hmm. But then it was also like your body, it, it translated to me as look, I had this image of people on a deserted beach and they're like shipwrecked and they do the SOS with logs on fire. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that to me was just like this image for this chronic underlying inflammation and mm -hmm. also the call for help. Mm -hmm. Like it's your body's call for help. Absolutely. And that was such a beautiful reframe for me too. Cause I think as women, one of the first things we do is ask ourselves, what am I doing wrong or what's wrong with me? Right. So as I started to explain to my patients, like the reason that you're having trouble sticking with your exercise or the way you're trying to eat isn't because you don't have good willpower. It's that your willpower has actually been hijacked in your frontal cortex by cortisol. And here's how this happens. And they would look at me a little like, that's weird, but that sounds exactly like what's happening. Yeah. They'd also feel like, oh, it's not that there's something wrong with me or I'm doing wrong. This is like mm -hmm. a cultural, systemic Mm -hmm. my, my childhood adverse event scores, like all the mm -hmm. things at once. But that's how SOS came up. So the idea is that the stress response is supposed to be activated as a short-lived thing. So I often use the gazelles at the watering hole, you know, on an African savanna and the lions coming. And interesting, the lions are in survival mode because they're hungry and they're on mm -hmm. the hunt. So they're in the prey mode the, the, um, fight mode. And then the gazelles, there's, there, they might, there's, you know, you can watch them in like the nature channel and their, their <laughs> nostrils flare a little, their ears start to prick a little, their backs go up a little bit and they're become hypervigilant to what's going on in their environment. And then when the lions get close enough, the gazelles run. So that's the flight mode. Mm -hmm. And then the, the lions will pick off, you know, the oldest, the youngest, the sickest, the slowest, and then what happens? The gazelles go right back to the watering hole. The lions go relax and eat their food and the whole system calms down. So that's the impact of adrenaline and short-lived cortisol response. In us, and this is why we do get ulcers, we're chronically in overdrive with that stress response. For most of us, it doesn't actually ever turn off. There's the constant to-do list Mm -hmm. And 
of no fault of our own, you know, and right now we're in crazy economic times. So people feel like they need to do more. And interestingly, in COVID, even though more people were working from home and had more freedom, the average work hours went up by 45 minutes a day and one day a week. So people were working more because wow. there was this like, you're always home. Yeah. No, you're always at work. You're always home. No commute. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And so there's this kind of constant low level stress. Then there's all the stressors that we're not even aware of, like mm -hmm. chronic electro exposure to electronics, stimulation from light when our natural body system wants to experience dark at a certain mm -hmm. time of day. And then the more punctuated stresses like the bills that come in or your kid getting sick or your adult parent that your older parent that you're caring for needing something. And then the bigger triggers, right? Climate change, COVID, mm -hmm. the next school shooting. <laughs> we can keep going. And yeah. So yeah, we're living in this really heightened state and that's why I call it survival overdrive. So this system is meant to keep, be a beautiful survival mode and actually mm -hmm. a little whiff of it, like a little bit of heightened stress mm -hmm. when we're otherwise in a pretty good baseline mm -hmm. can be motivating and stimulating mm -hmm. and actually boost our immunity too. But when it's chronic, it becomes never shuts off. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately it can lead to underfunctioning and just kind of breakdown. Mm -hmm. And that's where we can have some of the the really serious health consequences and I love, I loved how you talked about it, you know, in the, some of those conversations with your patients saying, this is your body's SOS, your body's warning sign. And if we, if we can start to shift before it, you know, as you did, as you said, you know, this is my, I my try. future ghost, if we can start to shift before, hopefully yeah. we can avoid some of those things, but obviously at any point along that path, um, what are some of the things, you know, for you personally, you talked about how you've, you know, you've become more aware of this perfectionism shadow side.